before about literary resources and general resources for the classroom, you will know that the future of teaching, at least in as far as it affects those who've been through Maureen's hands, is secure. So without any more ado, I would like to hand you over to Maureen Fowler. Thanks very much. Um, after such a fulsome introduction, <laughs> no pressure, um, and equally following the previous speaker, no pressure, um, I'm reminded that um, the speakers at these conferences have, each of them has a different purpose, and consequently that affects the way that they present. And my job here again today is to talk about some books that you, for the um, early years, S1 to 3, for the broad general education in secondary school, that you might not have come across. And so I have got quite a, um, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you more, probably more detailed information than the previous speaker, but it's for a different purpose. So um, the books I've selected for the presentation um, this year, and hang on, it should actually start the presentation, I suppose, um, if I can go back the way. So, sorry about this. Yay, they are actually there. Um, that's always a good start. Um, so, the books that I'm going to talk about today are all coincidentally debut novels um, for the, the writers. Two of the titles were actually selected by Tour of a Terminal Optimist by John Young, which was published in 2017. The Girl Who Lost Her Shadow by Emily Eilert, which was published in 2019. And A Kind of Spark by Ellie McNichol, published in 2020. So they're all relatively recent novels. Um, these novels have certain things in common. I've mentioned already they are all debut novels by these authors. They've all won prizes, some of them multiple exit, uh, that the book Each Cancer Sufferer is really very funny at times. So please feel that you are going to be in for a completely bleak session. The central protagonists of these books are a 15-year-old boy and an 11 and 12-year-old girl, respectively. Both of those girls have older siblings into the um, 17 teen years, um, and thus the appeal is wide-ranging. The Scottishness of these three, as I did in the previous presentation, I've decided to tackle these in chronological order by publication date. Um, and as before, my difficulty has been to distill these down to bite-sized chunks to give you sufficient detail and flavour to decide if these are books that you would like to use in the classroom. So if we start with um, a farewell tour of um, a terminal optimist, and there is a, a really nice play on words because um, uh, you know, his mother actually described him as an eternal optimist, but of course he was just the thing you need, 13, and the book won the Scottish Teenage Book Prize in 2019 and was also long listed for the Branford Bowes Award in 2018. Young began writing when his daughter became seriously ill, and I have to say sadly subsequently died. Um, and he says he found the act of escaping into another world to be cathartic because it took him away from her suffering and the tedium of the hospital ward. He says, this is the magic of stories and books. They take us to other places, let us experience new emotions, live new lives, and forget our troubles. Now, I would suggest that we, as a cohort of English teachers, kind of all know that. And part of what we are trying to do is to get our kids to believe that. Um, so it's really important that we think about that. So Connor Lambert is the 15-year-old central protagonist and he comes from um, a very severely damaged family. I, I played around with words for that family, fractured, damaged, um, 
functional, yeah, all kinds of words. There's not a, there's not a good fit actually uh, there um, uh, because it's just Connor and his mum at this point because his father wrote a book and his sister had, was knocked down and killed previous years before the events in this uh, in the novel. But both of these characters have importance to the plot as it transpires. Connor is an undersized who has a caliper on his leg and he is, of course, a target. The novel with um, a really got one of the things to the action and um, he's retaliating against his um, Nick describes um, he's uh, retaliating against his constant attacks where he kicks out his right leg the leg with the caliper on it and ends up on the floor Connor awaits his chance and surreptitiously puts a dead bird in Skates' lunch and instead of leaving the scene of the crime to kind of make good his escape, he hangs around to see the effects and inevitably gets chased by the bully. And so begins a series of misadventures that drive the plot of the novel. Now, having managed to get away from Skates on the Friday, he's got the weekend to kind of get over it, when he comes back to school on Monday, his first class is physics. He doesn't think that skates normally dog is not normally there. And so he assumes that he's perfectly safe. But lo and behold, skates arrives in the physics class. Um, and Connor is a marked man. And during the course of this le lesson, skates literally needles him into an outright job. And by doing that, I say he takes a compass and he jabs all the time. And of course, this is he then, and eventually gets to the point where Connor loses it and retaliates himself. So um, it it results in a night brawl, which results in both boys ending up in the hospital in Inverness. Now, can we consider that they're on Stornoway, and that involves a flight to the hospital in Inverness? It's quite a big deal. Um, and subsequently, they are taken into temporary care following a children's panel hearing. Because in the intervening period, Connor's mum has been taken into hospital following a breakdown, and it's discovered that Skates has been looking after himself since he's appeared off to live elsewhere. Forming a very, and initially it seems impossible, friendship, and unlike friendship. With the, the fellow juvenile delinquent skates, the pair stage a breakout and set off on a crazy ride across Scotland um, to find Connor's dad, an inmate at Shots Prison, hence the journey to Shots. Uh, despite his father having been in prison for the last nine years, Connor's mum has never allowed him to visit. At first, he was considered too young, and then it was because his mother told him that it was to protect his father's dignity and pride. Um, Skates, however, considers it essential that uh, Connor be allowed to visit his dad and suggests that they take the opportunity of their escape to travel to Short's prison. However, they don't know how they're going to get to where they're going. They're on the lam because they're being uh, chased by, you know, the authorities. Um, and so in an effort to recoup some of his own money that, that was actually to other um, he steals back some of their ill-gotten gains and they become targets of the thugs. So they've now got the police chasing them as well. So it becomes a bit like a kind of almost like a Keystone Cops thing at the, at the beginning. Uh, they escape from the island on a fishing boat and they land at Ullapool and, um, and begin 
to journey to shots um, with little in the way of resources, hunted by baddies and police alike. They dodge the police. There's joyriding and extreme hunting. If, if Connor's dying, he thinks he might as well enjoy one last wild adventure. There's only one problem, though. Or, well, one among the many problems, I suppose. Connor has left two things behind that are very important to him. The medication he needs to keep alive and a girl who makes his life bearable. Journey takes them to Inverness, Avonmore, Perth, Edinburgh, to shots on buses, in stolen cars, at one point using a, a liberated shopping trolley as a car for Connor. And, and on the way, this unlikely friendship between the two boys build. And going up in a ski lift, it, that is a, a, an absolutely hysterical description. Um, camping in the middle of a round Mundo which means no one leaves this world alive. But that bravado may not work for everyone. And I suppose when I go back to what I was talking about your, your trigger warning, you need to think about who you might have in your class, either pupils themselves or family members. It might go your kids well before you do any of these books. So it's a bravado that may not work for everyone. The author considers it vital to try to find a way of accepting a situation, even though it's tremendously brave, uh, and it's a tremendously brave and difficult thing to say, this is where I am, and I will make the best of it. Now, activity and creativity are great methods of increasing positive things, and these feature heavily within the novel. Well, this is a, and I've used inverted commas here, a cancer book. It does have bullies and irresponsible behaviour, but it also has charm and, and happiness to offer the reader. Music also features heavily within the book, and another interesting and useful additional link that you'll find in the book itself is a Spotify playlist. Um, which uh, gives you all the songs that are mentioned within the novel. And these are songs that have inspired Connor and Skates and indeed the author, um, Young himself. And I know that um, that's something that will speak to a lot of the kids in your class. And so it might be a good one to have as a, as a, a possible link. Um, moving to um, the, um, the girl who lost her shadow. Now, um, this one is my choice, and I'll explain why in a minute. Islet studied at Glasgow University, Glasgow School of Art, and the University of Glasgow, and she now works at the um, Glasgow Women's Library. She was awarded the Mary Hedewick Writing for Children Bursary from Moniac Moor in 2015, and she was children's writer in residence at the Wigton Book Festival, also in 2015. The Girl Who Lost Her Shadow is her first novel, and it won the Kelpie's Book Prize in 2017. Now, I have been struggling with this because the publication date of the book is 2019, but she was awarded the prize in 2017. So I can only assume that this is an internal prize within the Kelpie's publishing house, and that that was done pre-publication. There's, there's there, so um, that's, that's it. Um, this was my personal choice, as I've said, within this group of text, and I chose it for quite specific reasons. I liked the link with one of the great Scottish children's classics of Peter Pan, whose loss of his shadow got him into all sorts of troubles and adventures. I liked that the central protagonist was a girl with a sister and I particularly like the magical realism of the book. It also fits in with the themes of the that I have chosen to discuss today. Eilat herself, when discussing the motivation for this book, says, quote, one of the things I like most about writing is the way you see the world around you. When I first started thinking about the girl who lost her shadow, 
I found myself watching shadows all the time. My own shadow. The shadows of people around me. Shadows of clouds, of birds. I became curious about what happened when you jumped up or moved around a flame. How shadows grow, shift and flutter. And I think, um, as with, with all of the books that I am mentioning, um, we can all sit here and see the obvious interdisciplinary links with the books that we are reading because this links perhaps with your drama department and um, all kinds of ways that you can actually use this as a stimulus text. It's got, in Islet's ethereal fantasy, a 12-year-old girl on a Scottish island learns that she's braver and stronger than she thinks. And although I haven't actually included this in my sort of script for this, it is worth mentioning that because of one chance comment made about um, a gay mother, uh, we discover that she comes from Jamaica. And so it transpires that Gail and her mum and her sister are all, all have brown faces. And the other characters in the story have white faces. But there's not, there's not a great deal made of it. But it means that you're also kind of incorporating within the, the book those kinds of diversities as well. Um, Elle and her older sister Kay once longed to be marine biologists. Swimming in secrets, they were bound by their fascination with the sea. On the morning of her 12th birthday at breakfast, Gail watches her shadow under the door. Upstairs, her sister Kay has become listless and depressed since their dad left, always staying in her room. Kay used to be Gail's dependable companion, but now she doesn't seem to care about anything or anyone anymore. During an argument that morning, intended to try and G her sister up, which fails miserably, Gail is horrified to see Kay's shadow slip away too and feels it's her fault. Determined to get her sister's shadow back, whatever it takes, she finds herself led on a dangerous journey into nearby caves filled with dark tunnels where people have been known to disappear for days. Determined to make things right, Gail literally begins chasing shadows. The story is set in a place that feels familiar, yet it is sometimes mythical. Her adventures take her to unexpected places and Gail discovers that where there are shadows, Darkness, the only one who's that's missing. The author paints a clear picture with her words taking us through cramped tunnels or battling through raging seas. She's befriended by a character called Mirren, whom she encounters by accident in the caves, who informs her, quote, that people lose their shadows because they lose themselves, end quote. And that is so closely relevant to um, Gail, how she feels currently. Gail also learns that Mirren's brother, Francis, is a shadow collector. And so begins a chase that spans cinematic terrain, from a tunnelling cave network and woods drawn with enough mystery to fascinate the reader. Between Francis's homemade shadow swallowing contraption and stories that manifest in human-like forms, the story is an unusual and effective allegory for how vulnerable and disorientating mental illness can be. Francis's anguished reason for wanting to catch shadows complicates the ideas of who's bad. For example, Gail's chasing her sister. Francis is chasing it as well because he wants to collect it. So they become competitors.
for the same shadow. And that lends a sense of urgency almost to But Gail's determination to, to pursue this teaches her a lot about herself, including that it's normal to make mistakes. There are side strands regarding pearl thieves and a whale rescue that hint at environmentalism, but these are subservient to the main fabric of the novel. This book focuses on the challenges that we face when we experience loss. Now, the loss in this case is bereavement, but it's the loss of an absent father and it's the loss of the personality of her sister and what she's been used to. Um, it's a tale of becoming. It's full of twists and turns, enough to keep the reader turning the pages. And it's centred around the uh, main character of Gail and her journey. It's one of courage and self-discovery. And throughout, you actually are rooting for her to become the heroine that the reader knows she can be. It focuses on elements of sorrow and feeling of being lost, but it also covers hope, um, bravery and friendship. In terms of interdisciplinary learning, sections could be used in terms of health and well-being when considering issues like resilience and self-belief. It touches on considerations of ecology and the environment, which would link very well with um, science and geography or other kind of environmental topics. The intense and repeated messianic imagery results in an arresting story. Trapped as Kay is in her own mind, her influence and passion are always felt. And that's what I liked about the book, the fact that Kay is in the midst of this real depression, but she is still a well-drawn character with influence on the characters within the story. It's no surprise that the shadows reunite with the sisters. The book's finale is a warm return from home, from an unusual quest. It's artistic, it's moving, it's a love letter to sisterhood and the sea. It's a local, luminous tale of sisterhood and it tells of bravery, the power of friendship and being strong enough to ask for help when we really need it. Now, again, I go back to this notion about knowing your class, knowing who's in front of you, and knowing... But like the next book I'm going to talk about, I think it, it shows us a picture of those suffering from depression that those who are not suffering from depression can relate to and can help us, L. McNichol, and it's probably the one of the three that you would are, are most likely to know and have heard of. Um, McNichol is a best-selling and award-winning Scottish children's author. It's, again, her debut novel, and it won the Blue Peter Book Award and uh, the Waterstones Children's Prize in different years, you'll notice. Um, it was published, it was the Blackwell's Book of the Year in 2020. It won the Blue Peter Book Award in 2021. And then the two um, Waterstones Prizes um, also in 2021. So she had a good year that year um, with uh, prizes. Um, she is also the co-writer of, um, because again, hardly surprising, it was picked up as a gift for a TV series. And Ellie, um, Elle, Elle McNichol is a co-writer for the TV series. And she is also neurodivergent herself. Um, she is, I, I spoke to someone who work, has worked with her recently and she describes her as feisty. I think that's a good description for her. Um, she's an advocate for better representation of neurodiversity and disability in publishing and in the media. And she has founded something called the Adrian Prize to recognise children's fiction that explores the 
stability experience. She currently lives in North London and she has been um, especially well because the readers are in Addie's shoes and they, you, she writes it extraordinarily well. Can't help feeling and identifying with Addie. Spends her lunch time in Mr. Allison's library reading shark books. She makes sure her chicken and mayo sandwiches don't leave marks. The nice little details, kind of um, particular behaviours that make Addie feel secure, are nicely laid down in front of us. However, in Mr. Allison's classroom, Addie's handwriting is, quote, it's like a baby's, end quote. And her story is torn apart, literally, and in front of her face. And it takes every cell within Addie's body and her from melting down. If I have one criticism, is it the depiction of the class teacher? Understand that it is done as a literary device. I understand the presentation of a teacher of 30 plus years. But my fellow colleagues, I know lots of teachers of 30 plus experience who would never treat a child in that way. And so while it is a great device within the book, I find myself as a teacher educator shouting at the um, and saying, we're not like that anymore. Now, as I say, McNichol has said that she has written about experiences that she herself has had. So I take it as being true that in, at some point in her life that has happened to her. Addie is autistic and there's a great deal made about the correct phraseology. Not, she doesn't have autism. She is autistic. It's quite a, a specific thing. Yet Miss Murphy does not seek to understand her. But then again, Miss Murphy treats Kidi, Addie's older sister, Mary. Now, Kidi is one, Kidi is a twin. Kidi is in her first year at university. And they, so you've got Nina, the only non autistic child in the family. And that places her in an interesting and challenging position too. Um, uh, but Addy, uh, Kidi is Addie's life. She's also a and she explains she cannot control or explain herself. Yet she too to be fading as she works hard to fit into university. Nina, Kiddie's twin, the only sister not autistic, is inviting Addie to feature in her vlog tutorials. Media appearing in this girl uh, has her own channel and she vlogs about makeup and how to do makeup and that's how she spends her entire day. Um, and She's never included Addie up until this point, but then suddenly Addie's invited in to be part of her um, vlog. It's very interesting, the reaction and the comments. And latterly, Nina takes down the um, comments, certainly. But Addie actually managed to go around and find, you know how you never actually lose anything? Well, she comes across and they are extraordinarily hurtful comments. However, Miss Murphy uh, introduces witches as the class's latest subject, something that sparks in Addie. This is introduced as a fun new project to study in the run-up to Halloween. And as the teacher recounts how 16th century women were accused of witchcraft for reasons as innocuous as being handed, Addie is left stunned. Horrified that innocent people, including women from her own um, Scottish village, I'm sorry, I'm watching my time here, um, uh, 
persecuted, executed, and then forgotten by society. The revelation leaves her determined to lobby for a local memorial in her Scottish village. Oppression of those with perceived differences, of course, not confined to the history books. Addy herself experiences this at first hand in various forms, both at school and in her local community. But she doesn't sit back to accept injustice. And with support from a new girl at school, she fights valiantly for what she knows is right. Could it be that these women, misunderstood by their community and condemned to torture, symbolise the feelings that she has in school through her friendships? Suddenly, she's studying this history keenly, supported by her new friend, Audrey, and working through Miss Murphy's and her classmates' reaction. Thereafter, Addie determines the witches deserve an apology, a public plaque, a statement of recognition, and with her family's support, she petitions the village council for this memorial. Interested to know that um, last month, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, uh, the Royal Society of Scotland, did as part of its summer series an event called Witches of Scotland, who they are and why do their stories matter, and the, you can actually get the online version of that um, at the moment. Um, Addie researches and identifies closely with some of the women that she researches. Um, where events overtake them and the women become helpless and voiceless, and this is most articulately power powerfully articulated when Addie is placed in a similar situation when her prized possession, a thesaurus gifted to her by Kidi, is with an epithet is written over her sister's dedication. But about intervention except Audrey. Understandably, Addy reacts, and a bit like Connor in the first book, she attacks, physically attacks. Um, teachers arriving after the start didn't react and judge without knowing or finding out about the context. And in Miss Murphy's case, leaping to the wrong conclusions. And it's only when Nina and Kitty arrive at the school do the facts and Addie's experiences come to light. McCall offers an utterly convincing, hugely likeable narrative voice, challenging many a myth and stereotype, but never actually forcing its message. It's a powerful book with a gentle touch. Addie's sister is also on the spectrum and we're reminded that there are many different ways to be autistic. We see that there are regrettably also many ways to be ignorant and unpleasant and the 